New month, new resources. Let's just get right to it. Hey everyone, I hope you're well playing and making the games that you all love. You're joining me, your host, Max Pears. Absolute pleasure to be talking to you, whether it be morning, evening, or night. And thank you very much for taking time out of your day to listen in to this show. For those of you who are new to this, the very first episode of every month, I recommend new resources for us all to look out and consume to help make us better designers in general. After all, I do not know everything. So I want to share what I've found, what I've read, listened to, watched, all these elements. And again, if you've got more great resources, leave them in the comments or get in contact with me. All of my contact info will be down in the description, as will all of these articles as well. But first, let's have a quick word from today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is none other than me. What I've done, everyone, and I hope you're excited for this, is I've actually created a level design kind of store. What I've done in this store is put up different kinds of tips and tricks that you can find there, whether that be my actual ebook itself to that of level design pamphlets focused on different things such as traversal, stealth, breaking into the industry, as well as different talks that I have done which you cannot find anywhere else other than on this store. So if you are looking to improve on your level design skills and processes, then check out the level design store, which will be down in the description below where there'll be a link to find this. All you need to do is head over to gumroad.com forward slash level design lobby. I hope you like what you see and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you and now back to the show. Now, the first one is going to be a little bit different in terms of what we normally discuss. It's very much focused, say, on that of the kind of design resources elements and what we can improve, what have other designers done to help convey certain elements when they're building games, right? But this one's a bit more of a, a sad one. I think it just has to be mentioned. It's been the biggest news, obviously, of the week of when I've recorded this. And that is Unity's new business model and how this has basically kind of had such a big knock-on effect and we're only just talking about uh, the knock-on effects from a uh, hypothetical point of view yet. I'm sure the, uh, the, the ones who've released games haven't even felt it because it comes in January 2024, I believe. We're basically under new ownership. I don't know the, the new owner. Let me just find his name so I say it correctly. Uh, that's it. John Riccitello, um, who, from my understanding, also was CEO or very high up in EA at one point as well, if I remember correctly. And there is a uh, a lot of him, quote, old quotes of his now resurfacing of elements of really stupid quotes, to, to be honest. And it's very clear that this man is really just more set on selling that of the stock market. And I didn't realize, if I remember correctly, that Unity was bought out by a cryptocurrency. Let me just double check. Yeah, I think so. But someone please fact check me because I could be wrong. But the big thing is, is now that developers have to pay more and more money after releasing a game. If it hits, uh, I think it was 200 installs, I believe. And just how this is going to cause more and more issues. I think there is other now different... Uh, ways to pay for the uh, engine as well. And it's been one aspect that a lot of me and my friends have been talking about. Many of you know that I've used Unity both to previously release games back when I was working on mobile, uh, a personal one, and uh, also used it making personal work for, for levels as well. Now, I don't think it's going to stop you from necessarily making uh, levels. Now, the new plan i haven't seen the new details fully of the new plan so maybe it will i know that there's already talks about uh students and teachers impacted by the new to new unity rollout but for me i think it is just a uh, another discussing element of corporate greed from a 
a guy who already has a proven track record of not exactly caring other than just about the bottom line. And a man in his position, I also understand there is some truth of needing to do that. But again, for what Unity used to stand for in its values and making sure that it was a way for developers, indies, and the new generation to have a great way to to work and make games, it's a far cry from that. And heck, it had a great ramification on the whole elements of uh, Unreal and how Unreal and Epic changed their models in a, in a, a good way for developers again. But uh, yeah, man, it's a real, real shame to to see. Obviously, I said I've never met the CEO. I'm just reading some of the quotes, and I'd, I said I've got a link to it underneath called "Death of Unity," and you will see some of the quotes that just make him seem. <laughs> not a particularly nice or respectable uh, guy for sure in that but uh yeah i think it's just worth mentioning just because i think people should be aware of it because it could impact you and your team if you're not already aware of it i'm sure many of you are but it is something that is of, of big news and something i don't think we should shy away from especially when the the business side it's not necessarily a, a big topic on this but i do think it is an element that obviously the more we know as developers, the more we understand, the better equipped we are to deal with, with anything, I think. So, yeah, a shame and, uh, yeah, not the the best one to start with. But now we've got the uh, obnoxious news out of the way. Let's actually get into the first resource. Now, I went back in time as I've gotten back into uh, watching some more of one of my personal favorite directors' work, which is Satoshi Kon who's done such great things as Perfect Blue, Millennium Actress, Paranoid Agents, Tokyo Godfathers, I think are his main ones. I think there might be one of a missing paprika, that's it. But he uh, sadly passed uh, very early and did leave a huge mark, right, uh, on the industry, but especially in how he edits and transitions it's part of the reason that he really appreciates the medium of animation in that where it gives him that freedom to really go throughout real bounds in terms of uh, transitioning in, in editing and every frame of painting who i don't even know what happened to them they blew up and then just vanished i mean the last video was seven years ago but they didn't seem to make that many in the grand scheme of it to yeah just vanish but anyway the the focus of the video is again to talk about his editing his style behind this and how he turns these transitions into something that is so memorable and yet so unique and it just got me thinking right that obviously in in video games right now cinematography is still very very new not necessarily in the sense of you have it and always have had it in the aspect of, say, uh, the cutscenes, right? Yet, we don't necessarily see it so much. God of War was probably the first one where everyone really kind of lost their mind because of the whole uh, water technique. And they really pushed that further forward. And I think looking at this, it's trying to figure out, and I'm personally trying to figure out, well, what's the next step? Because I do personally believe you'll probably see... Uh, other games replicate what God of War did in terms of that one uh, track shot. Um, I'm just speculating on this solely because it was so good. You're seeing loads of people appreciate it. And it worked so well that I just think it will become one of those uh, trends and normalities. But uh, watching, say, my uh, my partner play Starfield and after working on Cyberpunk, just seeing how... I don't want to use the word old or dated, but uh, restricted may be a better word in their conversations with the characters. Because obviously in Cyberpunk, we had that system where you'd move around a lot and you'd see them react to your movement. And they still react if you don't respond, but it's still very fixed, right? And it's a great way to play with cinematography. But I think watching this video makes me wonder, what is the the next element that we're going to see change in cinematography in the game uh, characters? Batman does some great stuff in there as well. But yeah, just uh, another aspect to think about that I'm really interested in. So that is number two. Now, number three, I haven't personally read just because I'm trying to avoid spoilers, but I think it'd be an interesting one to see because it comes from that of the game developer website, which they talk about the Baldur's Gate 3 quest is a must-play for game designers. 
It talks about uh, anti-ethyl, and that's all I know, and I really won't go into much more. But I think it's it's an interesting one that uh, they've pulled out such an important quest. And in certain games, there's ones that's always come through, or certain areas, right? Like Witcher 3 was the uh, Bloody Baron quest that was hugely revered. And so to see this one again and how uh, maybe it can impact our thoughts on that. And as I said, I shame I can't talk about it, but again, <laughs> if I've not played it, I sure as hell am not getting spoiled <laughs> for this, and hopefully I won't spoil it for any of you who are enjoying Baldur's Gate 3 as well at the time. But yeah, it looks like a really cool one uh, for that one, so do go check that out. Now, number four for us is my talk on spatial composition. This will be on the channel already. I think by the time this comes out, it's probably about two or three videos back. And it's me talking about how to set up spatial composition, which is a great way to help not only players create a mental map, but guide them through, allowing players to connect the space and feel the transition from, say, point A to point B or point B to point D, and really making it feel known with subtleties in that, in terms of the elements of architectural style, height, color coding, small things like this, but that can really have such a uh, tremendous impact on the way that player views and sees that of the world around them. So I think that is a really important one to, to look at. It's a great way to help. So yeah, I definitely recommend that, obviously. I'm <laughs> extremely biased but it is another good one to to check out in my opinion and then this one is a different medium it is a youtube short i know uh but i think obviously i'm not really into tiktok and i need to kick this habit of youtube shorts because i definitely just get sucked into the rabbit hole but the element that i'm focusing on is again it's a different medium we've spoke about understanding comics by scott um Sorry, I've forgotten the author's name, but it's a very good, uh, very good book. And this one is by a uh, independent comic maker called uh, Bad Ink Studios. I know it sounds like a tattoo parlor, but he's in this one. He's uh, kind of breaking down the importance and shapes and what you can do in terms of, say, speech bubbles to show intent, to show emotion behind them, behind that of the, say, the person who's asked the question, given an answer, and make that feel different. All of us, even if you're not a huge comic fan, will recognize what a speech bubble is. But I think it's important to, again, see a different medium, see how they tackle this, and the differences. Now, we may not use speech bubbles in some of our games, some games may do, but again, it's a different aspect that I just think is uh, fascinating to see from different mediums and how they handle this. What do they do to tackle these ones, right? So I'm really excited to share that with you. This one is extremely short, like 30 seconds at most. But a really cool one nonetheless. So go check that one out. So that wraps up our recommendations. So the first one was that on the death of Unity. Second was Satoshi Kon's editing style, how he really uses his medium of animation to really change and push boundaries. Then we have the third resource, which is Baldur Gates 3 Quest Design is a must-play for designers. Number four is my talk about spatial composition within level design. And then finally, that of that of speeching, speech bubbles and lettering for how comic books use them to show emotion. So thank you all very much for taking the time to listen to this. I hope that you have enjoyed it. I really enjoyed talking to all of you. Have a great week. Thank you. Check this stuff out. More content out there as well. And uh, yeah, recommend us, rate us, subscribe to us, all of that good stuff that helps. If you want to get in contact with me, you can so through our email, leveldesignlobby at gmail.com. Get in contact with me over, say, Twitter, slash X, uh, over at Max Pears. And then, yeah, thank you all just very much. Really appreciate. Take care of yourselves. We'll catch you all next time. Bye.